Elusagun Obasanjo Matthew Okikiola Ogunboye Eremu Obasanjo, GCFR, born 5 March 1937, is a Nigerian politician and military leader who served as Nigeria's president from 1999 to 2007. He was a member of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, from 1999 to 2015 and the African Democratic Congress Party since 2018. He is an ideological Nigerian nationalist. Obasanjo maintained multiple relationships. In London in 1963, Obasanjo wed Oloremi Akinlawan. She gave birth to their first child, Iabo, in 1967. Iabo and her father shared a tight bond. Oloremi claimed that Obasanjo beat her and he had affairs with other women. Early in the 1970s, they got divorced. Obasanjo started living as a common law couple with NTA reporter Gold Aura during that decade, and she gave birth to his two children. In 1976, after meeting Stella Abebe during a trip to London, he wed her. Together they had three kids. Businesswoman Linda Soares, who was murdered by auto thieves in 1986, was one of Obasanjo's other partners. Stella Obasanjo, the First Lady of Nigeria, passed away on October 23, 2005, one day after receiving an abdominoplasty in Spain. The doctor, identified only as A.M., was given a year in prison in Spain in 2009 for carelessness and was also compelled to make compensation of around $176,000 to her son. He kept most of his interactions with these women a secret. Some of his kids were angry with him claiming he treated their mothers badly and didn't give them any special privileges. Obasanjo is Yoruba by ethnicity, and his voice and attire emphasized this cultural identity. But he consistently emphasized his Nigerian identity over his Yoruba one, saying that, I am a Yoruba man who lives in Nigeria. I do not identify as a Yoruba man from Nigeria. He consistently stated that he preferred living in the country than living in the city. He has never consumed alcohol. He was described as possessing a sense of discipline and duty and emphasizing the value of leadership. Ilif described him as an instinctively cautious individual, and noted his scrupulous planning. Obasanjo consistently emphasized the principle he had learnt as a child, deferring to seniority. A guy with huge physical and intellectual vigor, according to Ilif, Obasanjo executed power with competence and ruthlessness, sometimes unscrupulously but rarely ruthlessly. In a similar vein, Erfler claimed that despite his often boorish and drab appearance, Obasanjo possessed a sharply acute mind and the ability to be rough and brutal. Ilif said he had an amazing capacity for labor. He was frugal with his money, had a simple life, and sought financial stability by making real estate investments. He speaks gently. Obasanjo often put in 18 to 20 hours a day in his 60s while having very little sleep. Every day he would begin with prayers. Obasanjo has high blood pressure and diabetes. He liked to play squash. Obasanjo's dedication to biblical literalism was evident in the publications he produced following his incarceration. The Darwinian theory of evolution was described by him as demeaning, devaluing, and dehumanizing. Following his release from prison, he wrote with far less stress on traditional culture as a moral compass and urged Nigerians to discard a large portion of their pre-Christian style of life. Obasanjo's born-again religion was strikingly conventional, according to Ilif, and it was consistent with mainline Baptist doctrine. He disapproved of the prosperity gospel that certain Pentecostalists in Nigeria were preaching. After his captivity, providentialism also came to play a significant role in his worldview. Chief Obasanjo also holds a number of additional chieftaincy titles including that of Alori Omo Ilu of Ibogan Alaugan. Others in his family currently hold or previously held chieftaincy positions.
the outstanding member of the second generation of independent African leaders who dedicated themselves to the consolidation of their post-colonial states, according to John Iliff, defined Obasanjo. He believed that Obasanjo's administration had four main accomplishments. He helped to establish the African Union. He kept control of the military. He somewhat tamed the domestic unrest roiling Nigeria. And he paid off the nation's foreign debt. His approval rating was 84% in December 1999, 72% in 2001, and 39% in September 2003. By September 2003, it had dropped to 39%. Throughout his career, Obasanjo was charged with corruption on numerous occasions, despite his insistence that his dealings were honest. In the 1990s, when he was imprisoned, some of Obasanjo's detractors claimed that he lost his humility and grew more convinced that he was destined by God to rule Nigeria and began to see himself as a messianic figure. According to Obasanjo's detractors, he had become corrupted by power and, especially during his second time in office, became motivated by the concept of holding on to power permanently. He attracted some animosity from Yoruba people during his first term as head of state because they felt he should have done more to further their ethnic group's interests in politics. Upon his release from prison, Obasanjo asserted that his detractors' criticism simply helped to affirm the rightness of my cause, and showed the depravity in a fallen and perverted world. Obasanjo was schooled primarily in Abeya Kuta, Ogun State after being born in the hamlet of Ibogan Alalgan to a farming family of the Awu branch of the Yoruba. He joined the Nigerian army and specialized in engineering, serving in the Congo, the United Kingdom, and India before reaching to the rank of major. During the Nigerian Civil War in the late 1960s, he was a key figure in defeating Biafran separatists, accepting their surrender in 1970. In 1975, a military coup installed a junta that included Obasanjo as a member of the ruling triumvirate. The Supreme Military Council selected Obasanjo as head of state after the triumvirate's commander, Matala Muhammad, was slain the following year. Obasanjo continued Matala's policy by overseeing budget cuts and increased access to free school education. He is increasingly linking Nigeria with the United States, and he has shown sympathy for parties in southern Africa who oppose white minority rule. Obasanjo, who was committed to restoring democracy, presided over the 1979 election, following which he handed over authority of Nigeria to Shehu Shigari, a freshly elected civilian president. He subsequently moved to Ota, Ogun, where he became a farmer published four books, and participated in international efforts to resolve numerous African problems. Sania Barcher gained power in a military coup in 1993. Despite protesting his innocence, Obasanjo was arrested and convicted of being a part of a plot to overthrow Abarcher's government in 1995. He became a born-again Christian while incarcerated and providentialism had a profound influence on his subsequent outlook. Following Abarcher's death in 1998, he was released. Involved in electoral politics, Obasanjo ran for president under the People's Democratic Party, PDP, in the 1999 presidential election, which he easily won. To counteract widespread ethnic, religious, and separatist violence, he depoliticized the military and enlarged the police and mobilized the army as president. To reduce Nigeria's spiraling debt, he withdrew the country's troops from Sierra Leone and privatized a number of state-owned firms. In the 2003 election, he was re-elected. He was a strong advocate of the African Union's founding and served as its chair from 2004 to 2006. He was influenced by pan-Africanist beliefs. Obasanjo's attempted attempts to amend the constitution to remove presidential term restrictions drew widespread condemnation. He received a PhD in theology from Nigeria's National Open University after retiring. 
Obasanjo has been referred to as one of the outstanding personalities of the post-colonial African leaders' second generation. He was praised for guiding Nigeria's transition to representative democracy in the 1970s as well as his pan-African initiatives to promote collaboration on the continent. Critics claim he was corrupt, that his administrations oversaw human rights violations, and that as president, he became overly concerned with consolidating and retaining his personal power. Ibogan Alaugan, a hamlet in southwest Nigeria, is where Matthew Alusagun Aremu Obasanjo was born. His second passport listed his date of birth as 5 March 1937. However this was an assumption based on the lack of contemporaneous evidence. Amos Adigan Obaluye Sanjo Obasanjo Bankole was his father, and Bernice Ashabi Bankole was his mother. Only he and a sister, Aduni Oluwale Obasanjo, survived childhood as the first of nine children. He was born into the Yoruba people's Awu branch. Obasanjo was raised in a Baptist church, and the village church was part of a mission established by the United States Southern Baptist Church. Muslims lived in his village and his sister later converted to Islam in order to marry a Muslim guy. Obasanjo's father was a farmer, and the youngster worked in the fields until he was 11 years old. He enrolled in the village basic school at the age of 11, and three years later, in 1951, he transferred to the Baptist Day School in Abaya Kuta's Awu Quarter. In 1952, he transferred to the town's Baptist Boys High School, his school fees were subsidized by the government. Obasanjo excelled in school and became a dedicated Boy Scout. Although there is no proof that he was involved in any political groups at the time, Obasanjo rejected his forename, Matthew, in high school as an anti-colonial stance. Obasanjo's father, meanwhile, had abandoned his wife and two children. Obasanjo's mother had to rely on commerce to make ends meet after falling into poverty. Obasanjo worked on cocoa and cola fields, fished, collected firewood, and sold sand to builders to pay for his education. He also worked at the school over the summer, cutting the grass and doing other manual labor. Obasanjo took his secondary school exams in 1956, after borrowing money to cover the entry costs. He began wooing Oloremi Akinlawan, the Awu daughter of a station master, the same year. By 1958, they were engaged to be married. After finishing school, he relocated to Abadan and began teaching. He took the University College Abadan entrance exam there, but after passing, he discovered that he could not afford the tuition fees. Obasanjo subsequently decided to pursue a career as a civil engineer and in order to do so, he responded to an advertisement in the Nigerian Army for officer cadet training in 1958. Obasanjo joined the Nigerian Army in March 1958. He saw it as an opportunity to complete his study while earning a living, but he didn't tell his family right once, knowing his parents would protest. The Nigerian Army was being transferred to the control of the Nigerian colonial administration at the time in preparation for full Nigerian independence, and there were initiatives to recruit more local Nigerians into the military's higher ranks. He was then sent to Teshi, Ghana, to attend a regular officer's training school. He sent letters and sent gifts to his fiancée in Nigeria while stationed abroad. He was chosen for six months of extra training at Mons Officer Cadet School in Aldershot, southern England, in September 1958. Obasanjo despised his time there, thinking it to be a classist and racist institution, and he struggled to acclimate to the colder, wetter English climate. It only served to strengthen his negative feelings toward the British Empire and its right to rule over its colonized inhabitants. He was awarded a commission and a certificate in engineering at Mons. Obasanjo's mother died when he was in England. After that, his father died a year later. Obasanjo returned to Nigeria in 1959. He was assigned to the 5th Battalion as an infantry subaltern in Kaduna. Obasanjo resided in Kaduna for the first time, 
and it was his first time in a Muslim-majority area. Nigeria became an independent country when he was there, in October 1960. The 5th Battalion was sent to the Congo as part of a United Nations peacekeeping mission shortly after. The battalion was stationed in Kivu province, with Bakavu as its headquarters. Obasanjo and others in the Congo were in charge of defending civilians, especially Belgian immigrants, against soldiers who had rebelled against Patrice Lumumba's administration. Obasanjo was kidnapped by mutineers in February 1961 while evacuating Roman Catholic missionaries from a post near Bakavu. The mutineers debated putting him to death, but were told to let him go. The 5th Battalion left the Congo in May 1961 and returned to Nigeria. He had been named a temporary captain throughout the fight. He later stated that his battalion's pan-African enthusiasm was reinforced by his service in the Congo. In the early 1960s, he utilized his earnings to purchase property in Abadan, Kaduna, and Lagos. Obasanjo was dispatched to India in 1965. He stopped in London to see his wife on the way. He attended the Defence Services Staff College in Wellington, New Zealand, and subsequently the School of Engineering in Pune, India. Obasanjo was outraged by the starvation he witnessed in India, but he was intrigued by the country's culture, which drove him to read comparative religion books. In January 1966, Obasanjo returned to Nigeria to find the country in the grip of a military coup led by Major Emmanuel Ifeajuna. Almost everyone involved in the coup was from the Igbo ethnic group in southern Nigeria. Obasanjo was one of the many people who warned that the situation could devolve into civil war. He promised to act as a go between between the coup plotters and the civilian administration which had delegated authority to military commander-in-chief Johnson Aguiyi Aronsi. Elusagun met Aronsi in Lagos after the coup failed. Aronsi quickly terminated Nigeria's federalism with his unification proclamation in May 1966, escalating ethnic tensions. A second coup occurred in late July. Aronsi was slain in Abadan by forces of northern Nigerian provenance who also massacred roughly 200 Igbo soldiers. General Yukubu Gowen ascended to the throne. Obasanjo was in Maiduguri at the time of the coup attempt. He instantly returned to Kaduna after learning of it. He discovered that the 3rd Battalion's northern forces were rounding up, torturing, and killing Igbo soldiers. Although Elusagun was not Igbo, the governor of northern Nigeria, Hassan Katsina, recognized that as a southerner, he was still in danger from the mutinous troops. Katsina ordered Elusagun and his wife back to Maiduguri for ten days to be safe till the violence died down. Obasanjo then sent his wife to Lagos before returning to Kaduna, where he stayed until January 1967. He was the most senior Yoruba officer in the north at the time. Obasanjo was appointed chief army engineer in Lagos in January 1967. Tensions between the Igbo and northern ethnic groups grew, and in May, Igbo military officer C. Odomegwu Ajukwu founded the Republic of Biafra, declaring independence for Igbo majority areas in the southeast. Nigeria's government dispatched Obasanjo to Abadan on July 3 to act as the Western State Commander. On July 6, violence between the Nigerian army and Biafran rebels erupted. On July 9, Ajukwu dispatched a column of Biafran forces across the Niger Bridge in an attempt to conquer the Midwest and attack Lagos from there. Obasanjo attempted to blockade the city's entrance roads. Victor Banjo, the Yoruba officer in charge of the Biafran attack group, sought to persuade Obasanjo to let them through, but he refused. Matala Muhammad's 2nd Division, which was operating in the Midwest, appointed Obasanjo as the rear commander. Obasanjo, who was based in Abadan, was in charge of ensuring that the 2nd Division was well supplied. Obasanjo cultivated his contacts with the Yoruba elite while teaching a military science course at the University of Abadan. During the war, 
There was widespread dissatisfaction in the Western State, and Obasanjo resigned from the Western State Executive Council to avoid responsibility for these issues. In November 1968, when Obasanjo was gone from Abadan, armed villages led by the Farmers Agbakoya Association stormed the city hall. Ten protesters were killed by troops in retaliation. When Obasanjo returned, he established a commission to investigate the occurrences. Colonel Benjamin Adekunle, who was leading the invasion on Biafra, was replaced by Gowen, who required another senior Yoruba. Despite Obasanjo's lack of combat experience, he chose him. Obasanjo landed in Port Harcourt on May 16, 1969, to take up his new job, commanding between 35,000 and 40,000 troops. He spent the first six weeks of his military career resisting a Biafran invasion on Abba. He toured the whole front line and was wounded in the process. Among his men, he developed a reputation for bravery as a result of these deeds. Obasanjo began Operation Finishing Touch in December, directing his forces to push on Amuahia, which they captured on Christmas Day. This effectively chopped Biafra in half. He then launched Operation Tailwind on 7 January 1970, taking the Uli Airport on 12 January. The Biafran chiefs agreed to surrender at this point. Obasanjo met with Biafran military commander Philip Effiong on January 13. Obasanjo insisted that Biafran troops lay down their guns and that a delegation of Biafran officials travel to Lagos to publicly surrender to Gowen. Obasanjo spoke on regional radio the next day, advising Nigerians to remain in their homes and assuring their safety. Many Biafrans and international media outlets worried that the Nigerian army would perpetrate widespread atrocities against the defeated population, despite Obasanjo's best efforts to prevent this. He told his troops in the area to stay in their barracks and let the local police handle law and order. Retaliatory attacks on the local populace were carried out by the 3rd Division, which was more isolated. Obasanjo was harsh with the culprits, flogging those who looted and shooting those who raped. Obasanjo garnered esteem in Gowen's regime for emphasizing magnanimity while in charge of reintegrating Biafra into Nigeria. As an engineer, he prioritized water supply repair. By May 1970, all of the region's important towns had been restored to the water supply. Obasanjo's hashtag efforts in ending the conflict earned him the title of war hero and made him a household name in Hash Nigeria. Obasanjo came to Abeya Kuta in June 1970, and was greeted as a returning hero by the crowds. After that, he was assigned as the brigadier commanding the Corps of Engineers in Lagos. Gowen said in October that the military government would hand over power to a civilian administration in 1976. Meanwhile, a political party ban remained in effect, and Gowen made little headway toward establishing a civilian government. Obasanjo was on the decommissioning committee under the military regime, which proposed drastic troop reductions in the Nigerian army throughout the 1970s. Obasanjo travelled to the Royal College of Defence Studies in the United Kingdom in 1974 for a course. After his return, Gowen appointed him Commissioner for Works and Housing in January 1975, a position he held for seven months and during which he was significantly responsible for the construction of military barracks. Obasanjo purchased a former Lebanese company in Abadan in 1970 and hired an agent to handle it. After retiring from the military in 1973, he formed Temperance Enterprises Limited, a company through which he could pursue economic interests. He continued to engage in real estate, owning two homes in Lagos and one each in Abadan and Abeya Kuta by 1974. There were rumors that Obasanjo was involved in the rising tide of corruption in Nigeria, although no clear evidence of this ever surfaced. Oloremi's opposition to his interactions with other women ruined his marriage with her. Their marriage was annulled in the mid-1970s. In a traditional Yoruba wedding, 
he married Stella Abebe in 1976. Gowen was deposed by a coup led by Shehu Musa Ya Adua and Joseph Garber in July 1975, and he fled to Britain. They hadn't told Obasanjo about their plans because he was known to be against coups as a tool for regime change. The plotters sought to replace Gowen's authoritarian authority with a triumvirate of three brigadiers whose actions might be overruled by the Supreme Military Council. They persuaded General Matala Muhammad to become the head of state, with Oba Sanjo as his deputy and Danjuma as the third member of the triumvirate. Oba Sanjo was the workhorse and the brains of the trio, according to Ilif, and was the most eager for a return to civilian authority. The triumvirate, working together, enacts austerity measures to combat inflation, establishes a corrupt practices investigation bureau replaces all military governors with new officers who report directly to Obasanjo as chief of staff, and launches Operation Deadwood, in which 11,000 civil servants are fired. The administration announced preparations for an election in October 1975 that would result in civilian rule in October 1979. It also announced plans to form a committee to design a new constitution with Obasanjo overseeing the selection of the 49 members. The government also announced the creation of seven new states, based on the Arifeke Commission's recommendations. At Obasanjo's request, Abe Akuta was to be the capital of one of these new states, Ogun. On the commission's advice, it also announced gradual intentions to relocate Nigeria's capital from Lagos to Abuja, which is more central. Both Obasanjo and Danjuma were promoted to the rank of Lieutenant General in January 1976. Matala and Obasanjo shared a commitment to eliminate European colonialism and white minority control in southern Africa, which was reflected in their foreign policy decisions. Obasanjo got increasingly preoccupied with this cause. Angola's civil war began after the country gained independence from Portugal because the opposing FNLA and UNITA were aided by the white minority government in South Africa, Nigeria recognized the legitimacy of the government declared by the MPLA, a Marxist party backed by the Soviet Union. Nigeria began urging other African countries to recognize the MPLA administration in addition to offering material aid, and by early 1976, the majority of states in the Organization of African Unity, OAU, had done so. This is a momentous occasion, commemorating the beginning of the last struggle against colonialism, imperialism, and racism in Africa, Obasanjo said at an MPLA anniversary celebration in Luanda in February 1976, leading a Nigerian delegation. Colonel Buka Suka Dimka led a coup against Nigeria's government in February 1976, during which General Matala Muhammad was killed. An attempt on Obasanjo's life was also made, but the incorrect person was murdered. Dimka's coup failed due to a lack of backing from the military, causing him to leave, despite the fact that Obasanjo did not attend Matala's funeral in Kano he announced that the government will fund the construction of a mosque on the burial site. Obasanjo attended a meeting of the Supreme Military Council after his assassination. He expressed a wish to withdraw from office, but the council persuaded him to succeed Matala as the country's leader. As a result, he was elected chair of the council. Obasanjo went into the Dodan barracks, fearful of more assassination attempts, while 39 persons accused of being involved in Dimka's coup were executed, prompting claims that Obasanjo's response was harsh. Obasanjo promised to carry on Matala's policies as president. Aware of the risk of alienating northern Nigerians, Obasanjo appointed General Shehu Ya Adua as his replacement and second in command as chief of staff, with Supreme Headquarters completing the military triumvirate. With Obasanjo as president and General Theophilus Danjuma as chief of army staff, the three went on to re-establish control over the military regime. Obasanjo asked the Supreme Military Council to debate and reach a consensus. 
Many people asked why, as a Yoruba Christian, Obasanjo chose a member of the northern nobility, Yaadua, as his second in command, rather than a fellow Yoruba Christian. Obasanjo prioritized national interests over regional problems, encouraging both youngsters and adults to recite the new national vow and anthem. In order to acquire a larger spectrum of viewpoints, he organized an informal seminar on a topical problem every Saturday, inviting persons other than politicians and public workers. Islamic academics and traditional chiefs were among the people he sought counsel from. Nigeria's economy had become overheated by the mid-1970s, with a 34% inflation rate. Obasanjo pursued austerity measures to reduce government spending in order to address Nigeria's economic woes. Obasanjo proposed in his 1976 budget to cut government expenditures by a sixth, reducing prestige projects while increasing investment on education, health, housing, and agriculture. He also established an anti-inflation task team, and inflation had dropped to 30% within a year of Obasanjo taking office. Obasanjo was not a big fan of borrowing money, but with the help of the World Bank and the IMF, Nigeria was able to secure a $1 billion loan from a group of banks. Critics on the left contended that this made the country a slave to Western capitalism. Nigeria borrowed a total of $4,983 million over the next two years of Obasanjo's presidency. During the 1970s, Nigeria had yearly population growth of about 3%, which would quadruple the country's population in just over 25 years. Obasanjo later said that he was unaware of this at the time since his government lacked a population control policy. Nigeria's population increase has resulted in rapid urbanization and a housing shortage in the country's cities. To address this, Obasanjo's 1976 budget called for the construction of 200,000 new housing units by 1980, yet only 28,500 were actually built. Obasanjo's government also imposed rent and price controls in 1976. In 1976, Obasanjo's government passed legislation designating most major businesses as essential services, prohibiting strikes within them, and authorizing the arrest of disruptive union leaders in order to reduce the impact of labor strikes. It combined 42 unions into the Nigerian Labor Congress in 1978. The Kano River Project, the Bikalori Scheme, and the South Chad Irrigation Project were all announced under Matala, and Obasanjo continued with them. Agricultural development projects in Fintua, Gusau, and Gombe were also continued by his government. To slow the encroachment of the Sahara Desert in the north, certain forestry efforts were started. Obasanjo oversaw the construction of two major hydropower dams and a thermal plant to accommodate the country's expanding demand for electricity. The oil sector remained a vital element of Nigeria's economy, and the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation was amalgamated with the Ministry of Petroleum Resources under Obasanjo to establish the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation, NNPC. Obasanjo also supported the construction of a liquefaction facility in Boni, which was 62% funded by the NNPC. However, his successor abandoned the project due to rising costs. Obasanjo also proceeded to develop the Ajaukuta Integrated Steel Factory, an inherited project that many government servants thought was unsustainable. Nigeria's agricultural productivity began to decline in the mid-1970s, owing to successive government's decisions to import food rather than grow it domestically. Obasanjo announced Operation Feed the Nation in May 1976, a program to revitalize small-scale farming that paid students to grow during their vacations. The program also included the elimination of tariffs on livestock feed and farm implements, the subsidization of fertilizer use, and the facilitation of agricultural loans. Obasanjo issued the Land Use Decree in March 1978 giving the state ownership of all land, 
This was intended to prevent land speculation and hoarding, and it received support from the Nigerian left, despite the opposition of many landowning families. It was one of Obasanjo's great successes during his presidency. What is wrong with our traditional society, which respects age, experience, and authority? Or the norm that everyone is his brother's keeper, which makes ethical standards universal? Or the practice of stigmatizing and ostracizing evildoers and the indolent? Or the extolling of virtues and values not necessarily based on materialism, but on community service and the encouragement of excellence? He asked. These are ideas that have stayed with us throughout the ages, and we must never allow the current wave of individuality, egotism, materialism, and ostensibly sophisticated living to wash them away. Obasanjo maintained Nigeria's push for universal primary education, which he had inherited from Gowen. In 1976, he passed the Primary Education Act which increased enrollment in free but optional primary schooling from 6 million to 12.5 million between 1975 and 1980, despite a scarcity of instructors and materials to meet the demand. Obasanjo initiated free secondary education in technical areas in the 1977-78 school year, which was expanded to all secondary schooling in 1979-80. Nigeria slashed university financing at the same time. In 1978, it stopped distributing student loans and tripled university food and lodging fees. Student protests broke out in a number of locations, with fatal gunshots in Lagos and Zaria. Obasanjo responded by closing numerous campuses, prohibiting political activities on campus, and banning the National Union of Nigerian Students. The harshness of these measures may have been related to fears that the student disturbance was linked to a planned military coup that was discovered in February 1978. Obasanjo was enraged by the protesting students' actions, claiming that they demonstrated a shift away from traditional values such as respect for elders. Nigeria's public sector expanded rapidly as a result of the country's state-directed development. Evidence of widespread corruption in the country's government arose, and while accusations were frequently leveled at Obasanjo, no substantial evidence was presented. To combat the government's image of corruption, Obasanjo's administration banned the use of Mercedes automobiles as government transportation and replaced them with more humble Peugeot 504s. Champagne imports were likewise prohibited. Obasanjo's government pushed for military cuts, and during the course of 1976 and 1977, 12,000 soldiers were demobilized. These soldiers were sent to new rehabilitation centers to help them acclimatize to civilian life. Obasanjo was also accused of repression in the political sphere. After a member of his entourage got involved in an incident with military personnel, the Nigerian singer and political activist Fela Kuti's residence, Kalakuta Republic, was stormed and burned to the ground. Fela and his family were assaulted and raped, and his mother, Chief Fun Malayo Ransom Kuti, a political leader and founding mother, was tossed out a window. She suffered significant injuries as a result of this, and she died as a result. As a protest against the government's political repression, Fela took a coffin to the then presidential mansion at Dodon Barracks in Lagos. Obasanjo was anxious to position Nigeria as a major African leader, and during his tenure, the country's influence grew on the continent. He revived Gowen's idea to conduct Nigeria's Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture in Lagos in February 1977, despite internal detractors claiming it was too expensive. Obasanjo gave the economic community of West African states, ECOWAS, minimal priority and enraged many of the organization's Francophone members by insisting that Nigeria, as the greatest financial donor, host the organization's headquarters in Lagos. Relations with neighboring Ghana deteriorated as well. In 1979, 
Nigeria stopped off oil supplies to the country in protest of political opponents being executed by Jerry Rawlings' new military government. Margaret Thatcher's appointment as British Prime Minister in 1979 exacerbated the deterioration of UK-Nigerian relations, as Obasanjo saw her as overly friendly to white minority governments in southern Africa. Nigeria's long-standing relations with the United Kingdom were weakened under Obasanjo, and the country allied itself more closely with the United States. Obasanjo supported Jimmy Carter's administration in the United States, which was elected in 1976, because of Carter's commitment to achieving majority rule in southern Africa. While Carter was in Nigeria in 1978, Carter's ambassador, Andrew Young, forged a close personal friendship with Obasanjo. The decision to switch allegiances was taken for economic rather than ideological grounds, as the discovery of oil in the North Sea meant that the United Kingdom had become a competitor rather than a client of Nigerian oil. The UK's refusal to extradite Gowen enraged Obasanjo's government, which believed the British government of being engaged in the coup against Matala. For these reasons, it considered suspending diplomatic relations with the United Kingdom in 1976, but decided against it. Despite this, Obasanjo declined to visit the United Kingdom and advised his officials against doing so. When Margaret Thatcher became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in 1979, she began a more friendly relationship with the white minority governments of Rhodesia and South Africa. Nigeria retaliated by seizing a British vessel suspected of carrying Nigerian oil to South Africa, prohibiting British corporations from bidding for Nigerian contracts, and nationalizing British Petroleum's operations in Nigeria. According to ILIF, Obasanjo's desire to hasten the end of white minority rule in southern Africa became the cornerstone of his foreign policy. Nigeria provided money to people protesting white minority rule in the region, permitted these groups to operate offices in Lagos, and provided refuge to a variety of refugees fleeing southern African regimes. Obasanjo took a strong stance against South Africa's apartheid administration, announcing that Nigeria would boycott the 1976 Summer Olympics since New Zealand, which was competing, had sporting relations with South Africa, which was barred from competing owing to apartheid. Obasanjo banned any contractors with South African ties from functioning in Nigeria in 1977, with British Petroleum and Barclays Bank being the major targets. Nigeria sponsored the United Nations Conference on Action Against Apartheid in Lagos that year, and Obasanjo visited the United States in October urging the country to halt providing armaments to South Africa. He spoke to the United Nations General Assembly while in Nigeria, and Nigeria was given a seat on the UN Security Council two weeks later. The Rhodesian Bush War was initiated by opposition to white minority rule in Rhodesia, and Obasanjo's government felt that armed conflict was the only way to oust Rhodesia's government. He urged the various anti-government factions to work together, pushing Robert Mugabe, the head of ZANU, to accept the leadership of ZAPU's Joshua Nkomo. In 1977, the United Kingdom and the United States proposed a transition to majority government in Rhodesia, which would be followed by a period in which the country would be governed by UN forces. Obasanjo endorsed the idea and traveled to Tanzania, Zambia, Mozambique, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo to encourage their governments to follow suit. Nigeria, on the other hand, withdrew itself from British efforts to end the Rhodesian Bush War after Thatcher became Prime Minister, and was excluded from any substantial role in the UK brokered process that led to multi racial democratic elections in Rhodesia. Obasanjo attended OAU summits as president of Nigeria. He advocated the institution of a standing committee to settle disagreements between OAU member nations at that meeting in July 1977. He warned of Cold War involvement from both sides at the 1978 meeting. 
he advocated for the development of a pan-African military capable of participating in peacekeeping efforts on the continent at the next meeting. Obasanjo took part in several mediation attempts around Africa to boost Nigeria's international involvement. He urged Benin and Togo to resolve their border conflict and reopen their border in 1977. He also sought, but failed, to mediate a dispute between various East African republics in order to avert the collapse of the East African community. He sought to resolve the Agaden issue between Ethiopia and Somalia as chair of the OAU Mediation Group, but was once again unsuccessful. He also failed to repair the rift between Angola and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Obasanjo convened a conference in Kano on behalf of the OAU to mediate the Chadian civil war. Several factions agreed to a ceasefire, a national unity government, and the use of Nigerian troops as peacekeepers. Despite this, the war continued, and Nigeria responded by shutting off Chad's oil supplies. In August 1979, a second meeting on the dispute was held in Lagos, which resulted in the formation of yet another short-lived transitional administration. He led an OAU mission to resolve the Western Sahara crisis in the final year of his military regime. The military administration has formed a constituent drafting committee to prepare a new constitution that would be adopted if civilian control is restored. The committee claimed that Nigeria's governance system, which is based on the British parliamentary system, should be replaced with a presidential system, in which a single elected president serves as both the head of state and the head of government. It urged for numerous limits on their power, including a federal system with independent elected institutions at the federal, state, and local levels, to avoid this president becoming a tyrant, as had happened elsewhere in Africa. The proposed constitution was released in October 1976, and it was debated in public for the next year. The 1979 elections were held between the months of July and August. Between 30 and 40 percent of those who were eligible to vote showed up, and although it was calm, there was rigging on both sides. There was a dispute over who won the presidential election, and Obasanjo insisted that the Electoral Commission settle it instead of him. They proclaimed Shehu Shigari the victor, which the second-place finisher, Obafemi Awolowo, unsuccessfully appealed to the Supreme Court. At his swearing-in ceremony, Obasanjo gave Shigari a copy of the new constitution. Shigari assumed office in October 1979. The Second Republic of Nigeria officially began at this point. The foundation of Obasanjo's continued good standing over the following two decades was his contribution to the return of Nigeria to civilian governance. He was pushed to hold on to his position by a number of domestic and foreign figures, notably the presidents of Zambia and Togo, Ignacing Bay Ayadema and Kenneth Kaunda. He alienated a large portion of the Yoruba elite by refusing to support his fellow Yoruba, Awolowo. Awolowo charged Obasanjo with directing Shigari's win, which Obasanjo vehemently refuted. In April 1979, just before leaving office, Obasanjo elevated himself to the rank of general. As a four-star general, he continued to be paid by the government. He returned to Abeya Kuta in October after leaving office. Obasanjo set himself up as a farmer after completing a six-week course at an agricultural training college in an effort to serve as an example and promote agricultural independence. He acquired at least 230 hectares of land in Ota to start his farm on, and he settled there in a brick farmhouse. His acquisition of so much land was met with local resentment, and as a result, he was the target of numerous lawsuits. Through his Temperance Enterprises Limited, afterwards known as Obasanjo's Farms Limited, he organized his agricultural enterprises. He focused especially on raising chickens. By the middle of the 1980s, his farm was producing 140,000 chicks each week. In other parts of Yoruba land, he established farms, and by 1987, he had eight locations with over 400 employees. 
Obasanjo funded underprivileged pupils who attended his former school in Abayakuta, as did other important Yoruba individuals. Shigari's civilian government came under increasing fire from Obasanjo, who thought the president was unprepared and weak. Nigeria's economy entered a recession as a result of changes in the price of oil globally. Senior military officials requested Obasanjo to retake control of the nation in May 1983, but he declined. Without the assistance of Obasanjo, they removed Shigari in a low-violence coup in December. The new head of state in the military is Muhammadu Buhari. Initially backing Buhari's administration, Obasanjo claimed that Nigeria's representative democracy had failed. He lauded Buhari for his war against indiscipline, cutting imports in half, and bringing the budget back into balance. Buhari was deposed in August 1985, and Ibrahim Babangida, the army chief of staff, took over as leader. Some of Babangida's economic measures, including as the Naira's depreciation, drew criticism from Obasanjo. His resistance to Babangida's leadership had prompted him to advocate for Nigeria's re-democratization by 1992. He also started to oppose the 1970s economic indigenization measures, claiming that the constitution ought to forbid the seizure of foreign investments. He believed that the government should place more of an emphasis on private-led growth. He urged Nigerians to have fewer children, in their own economic and national socio-economic interest, as he grew more alarmed by the country's rapid population rise, a subject he had disregarded while in power. Obasanjo authored four books in the eleven years that followed his resignation from office. My Command, a memoir of his experiences in the Civil War, was written by Obasanjo while he was a distinguished fellow at the University of Abaddon in 1980. It was released in November of the same year. Some readers criticized Obasanjo for what they perceived to be his betrayal of Matala Muhammad, and Robert Ade Inka Adebayo, a prominent Yoruba political figure, called for the book's withdrawal to stop it from creating discord. Ken Saro Wiwa, a friend of his, gave it a more favorable review and described it as masterful, albeit he thought there had been a lot of editorial help. He published Chukwuma in Ziogwu's book, in Ziogwu, in 1987. The two men had served together in the Congo. The next book written by Obasanjo, Constitution for National Integration and Development, was published in 1989. In it, he cautioned readers against Babangida's case for setting up a two-party system in Nigeria. Not My Will, his third book, was released in 1990. It gave a history of his term as president of the nation. Nelson Mandela, a prisoner of the South African anti-apartheid movement, met with Obasanjo in 1986. Pictured in 1998, he explained how it was a meeting I'll never forget. I recognized a South African, an African, and a world leader of no small stature in Mandela. He was physically and figuratively larger than all the leaders we encountered in South Africa. From his farm in Ota, Obasanjo started the Africa Leadership Forum in an effort to maintain his influence on the world scene. He also participated in the Palm Commission a body that debated disarmament and global security from 1981 to 1982 and was led by the former Swedish Prime Minister Olof Palm. Following this, Obasanjo served on panels for the World Health Organization, the Inter-Action Council of Former Heads of Government, and the United Nations. Obasanjo was mentioned as a possible replacement when UN Secretary General Javier Perez de Cuellar became unwell. Obasanjo started running for Perez de Cuela's position once he resigned, according to the announcement. He finished third in the UN Security Council voting, and Egypt's Botrus Botrus Ghali was elected to fill the position. In 1986, he traveled to Japan, and in 1987, he visited the United States. It was decided that an eminent persons group, EPG, 
would be established to open communication with the South African government in an effort to persuade it to abolish apartheid in the midst of a conflict in the Commonwealth of Nations over the UK's more sympathetic attitude of South Africa. Emeka Anyalku, the Deputy Secretary General of the Commonwealth from Nigeria, suggested that Obasanjo be chosen to co-chair the group with Malcolm Fraser, the former Prime Minister of Australia. Obasanjo agreed grudgingly. He and Fraser travelled to Cape Town in February 1986 and requested a meeting with Nelson Mandela, an incarcerated anti-apartheid leader and well-known figure in the outlawed African National Congress, ANC. Obasanjo was the only person allowed to meet with Mandela, and he later said that he was very impressed with him. Obasanjo next met in Lusaka with top ANC officials who were living in exile. The whole EPG visited South Africa in March 1986, at a time of escalating domestic instability and violence. Senior government officials were present when they met with them, including Prime Minister P. W. Bota, who Obasanjo later referred to as the most intolerable person he had ever met. According to the EPG study, the majority of South Africans wanted a peaceful, negotiated resolution between the government and anti-apartheid organizations, but the former was unwilling to consider this and had made little headway in putting an end to apartheid. Thus, the EPG advocated for the need for more international pressure. A Commonwealth committee agreed with the report's conclusions, but the UK disagreed. Obasanjo became even more angry with Thatcher as a result. The Commonwealth then appointed him to lead a group that was charged with figuring out what the frontline state's defences against South African incursions should be. Bota was succeeded by F.W. de Klerk, who released Mandela from custody. Mandela met Obasanjo at his house in Nigeria on one of his first trips abroad. Two months later, Obasanjo travelled to South Africa with a delegation from Nigeria to meet with influential politicians. He returned in September 1991 and pushed Mangasuthu Buthalezi, the Zulu leader, to negotiate with other factions in order to help put an end to apartheid and have a completely representative election. Obasanjo contributed to advancements in other parts of Africa. He made two trips to Angola in 1988 to support attempts to put an end to the civil war there. In addition, he made three trips to Sudan between 1987 and 1989, trying in vain to encourage talks to put an end to the Second Sudanese Civil War. He then participated in the 1994 general election in Mozambique as an observer. He travelled to Burundi in 1994 and 1995 and sought to ease tensions between the Hutu and Tutsi ethnic groupings. He had started to advocate for greater integration across Africa and suggested that six regional confederations may be created to accomplish this. He had begun to formulate ideas for an Africa Leadership Forum in June 1987 which would aid in educating and preparing politicians from all over the continent. It started hosting gatherings from Obasanjo's house, known as the Farmhouse Dialogues, roughly six times per year. Between 1991 and 1993, it also hosted quarterly international conferences and published the magazine Africa Forum. Obasanjo expressed worry that Babangida had no plans to relinquish his position as military ruler despite his apparent support for a democratic return. Obasanjo and Anthony Enahoro founded the Association for Democracy and Good Governance in Nigeria after the 1992 presidential elections were postponed. 31 domestic political personalities attended the group's first meeting in Ota in May 1993. In June 1993, there was an election that had a low turnout. The Social Democratic Party's SDP, Mashoud Abiola declared victory, although this was contested in court. After that, Babangida declared the election results invalid and announced a subsequent second election. The SDP contended that their candidate had already won the first election and opposed holding a second one. 
When Ernest Schoenecken's interim civilian administration came into power in August 1993 and announced plans for new elections in February 1994, Babangida subsequently decided to resign. General Sani Abak, according to Obasanjo, reminds one of a man who proposed a supper for the blind man with other degudas, he remarked, this ostensibly helpful person went back to steal the blind man's soup pot as soon as the others turned their backs on him. Again, the majority of us Nigerian spectators cheered. There were plenty of people at the supper, for all kinds of reasons, and the moral ramifications did not worry them. In the meantime, Sani Abacha strengthened his grip on the military and in November 1993 forced Shoneken to step down which gave him the opportunity to seize power. Prior to the coup, Obasanjo had called Abacha and urged him not to follow this path. Abacha requested a meeting with Obasanjo after seizing control. Although the latter did, it withheld its backing until Abacha's government gave a date for its own departure. Following this, Abacha disbanded the democratic institutions and political parties that were already in place and invited politicians from diverse backgrounds to join his Federal Executive Council. Obasanjo refused to suggest anyone for this council. In May 1994, Obasanjo and Yaadua founded the National Unity Promoters, an organization devoted to averting another civil war in Nigeria along ethnic lines. Obasanjo had been warning that Nigeria was on the verge of another civil war along ethnic lines. Abiola unilaterally proclaimed himself the leader of Nigeria in June and was taken into custody for treason. Obasanjo did counsel Abacha not to arrest Abiola notwithstanding his refusal to support the assertion. He then took the helm of a gathering of traditional figures where they made an effort to open a line of communication between Abacha and Abiola. His decision not to back Abiola infuriated many Yoruba, who attacked Obasanjo's property in Yorubaland. What Obasanjo perceived as retribution for not supporting Yoruba sectarian interests infuriated him. Obasanjo visited Denmark in March 1995 for the Copenhagen UN Summit on Social Development. While there, he learned that Yaadua had been imprisoned and that if he went back to Nigeria, he would definitely suffer the same fate. Nevertheless, he insisted that he had done nothing wrong and consented to going back. His passport was taken from him at the Lagos airport, and the following day, police came to bring him up from his home in Ota. Police said that Obasanjo was involved in Brigadier General Lawan Guadabi's conspiracy to overthrow President Abacha. As Obasanjo was being transferred between jail facilities, Former U.S. President Carter personally requested Obasanjo's release from Abacha. After being sent back to Ota, Obasanjo was put under house arrest for a period of two months. During this time, he was not permitted to use the phone, contact the media, or receive visitors. Colonel Bello Fadil, a military lawyer who was also charged with being a part of the plot, was tortured before he signed a statement claiming that he had traveled to Ota to inform Obasanjo about the coup while it was being planned. This was presented as proof to accuse Obasanjo of concealing treason, a crime punishable by death under Nigerian law. He was subsequently driven to the Okoye based State Security Interrogation Center. Obasanjo was tried in a military court on June 19, 1995. As a result of Abacha's demand, Obasanjo asserted during the trial that he had never met Bello Fadil. Bello Fadil also claimed that he had been coerced into signing the document accusing Obasanjo, but the court disregarded this denial. On July 14, the court sentenced Obasanjo to 25 years in jail. Yaradua and 14 other people who had also been charged with participating in the conspiracy received death sentences. Later, Obasanjo described it as his saddest day. Abacha remitted their sentences to incarceration and reduced Obasanjo's sentence to 15 years after U.S. President Bill Clinton threatened to embargo Nigerian oil if these executions went forward. 
Obasanjo originally was chained in solitary confinement at the Okoye Center, where he spent the following four months. He was then moved to Lagos' biggest prison, Kirikiri, where he spent time receiving treatment for his diabetes and hypertension in the prison hospital. Obasanjo expressed his disapproval of the overcrowding and unhygienic conditions in Kirikiri, saying that he would not wish it on my worst enemy. There, Bello Fadil apologized to Obasanjo for accusing him, and Obasanjo accepted his apology. After being smuggled out of jail and published, a note written by Bello Fadil outlining the circumstances helped to prove Obasanjo's innocence. Obasanjo and the other suspected conspirators were transferred to Joss Jail in Plateau State's Center Plateau after a number of weeks, where they were detained for several months. Obasanjo was initially only permitted to read the Bible and the Quran, but over time he was granted access to a larger range of books. Additionally, he was given writing supplies so he could correspond with other people and organizations. Eventually, Stella was also allowed to pay him a monthly visit. Pope John Paul II and Mandela both demanded his release, and he received honorary degrees from German and Indian foundations. Two volumes of letters and essays written in his honor were published by the Africa Leadership Forum, which was compelled to relocate to Accra, Ghana, to avoid persecution by Abarche's regime. Obasanjo was transferred from Jos to the more remote jail at Yola, Adamawa State, in the early months of 1996. He was permitted to tend a garden there. Obasanjo claimed that while imprisoned, he strengthened his Christian faith drew nearer to God, and experienced his conversion. From that moment on, Christianity took on a much more significant position in his own worldview. Following the temporary restriction on visiting clergy, he delivered 28 sermons each week at Yola. He recorded these sermons so they may be published after his release. When he was released from jail, Obasanjo continued to monitor the development of some of the younger inmates in an effort to reform them. Obasanjo was worried that he would be poisoned, especially in light of the widespread belief that Yaradua's death was the result of intentional poisoning. Lieutenant General Abdul Salami Abu Bakar was chosen by the military chiefs to succeed Abacha after his untimely death in June 1998. A week later, Abu Bakar issued a release order for Obasanjo and dispatched a plane to take him back to Ota. Abu Bakar disbanded the nation's existing parties and institutions in order to put Nigeria back under civilian control. He also unveiled a strategy that would result in the election of a civilian president in May 1999. Obasanjo, who was now a free man, traveled to South Africa, the United Kingdom, and the United States to receive medical care. Nigeria saw the emergence of numerous new political organizations, the People's Democratic Party, PDP, being one of the biggest. The PDP was an umbrella organization that aimed to be sufficiently inclusive if elected to prevent further coup attempts. Obasanjo was suggested as the best presidential candidate by prominent PDP members. They believed he could command respect on a global scale and, as a military leader, could keep the nation united in the face of upcoming coup attempts and secessionist movements. They also stated that Obasanjo had established himself as a southerner without partisan animus against the north and that Nigeria required a president from the south to balance out its past northern leadership. His friends and relatives warned him against running claiming that he risked ruining his name or getting killed. Obasanjo joined the PDP on October 28 and stated a week later that he was running for president as the party's nominee, despite his apparent reluctance. He underlined during his campaign his intention to continue what he saw to be the legacy of good government after leaving office in 1979. He made N356 million at a fundraising event. N120 million of which came from businessman Aliko Dangote. Men in the military and the new business class contributed the majority of these donations. He traveled the nation giving speeches and pursuing audiences with powerful people. 
Cultivating state governors was a key component of his strategy. His campaign took center stage over that of his primary opponent, Alex Ekwuemi, who was largely despised by the military and residents of the North. The PDP was growing in popularity in Nigeria, where it won the most votes in the Senate and House of Representatives elections in February 1999, as well as the state elections in January 1999 and the local government elections in December 1998. A PDP convention was called on February 14, 1999 to choose its presidential candidate, compared to Ekwuemi's 521 votes and the 260 cast for the other five contenders, Obasanjo 1,658 won votes. Obasanjo chose Atiku Abu Bakar as the PDP's vice presidential candidate because he was a northerner. The APS Olu Fali was Obasanjo's lone opponent in the 27th of February presidential election. Only around 25% of eligible voters cast ballots, and there was some rigging but no violence. Obasanjo received 63% of the vote according to the official results. He lost in all six of his native Yoruba lands states. Obasanjo moved into the presidential compound at Aso Rock in May after having it exercised. He took the oath of office on May 29 in Eagle Square in Abuja. He appointed an equal number of ministers from the north and south of Nigeria, despite some Muslim northerners being offended by the majority of Christians in his new cabinet. Obasanjo's cabinet was often criticized for being overly old, conservative, and inexperienced, particularly when it came to economic issues. Nigerians saw higher levels of freedom during his first term in office, and press freedom allowed for harsh criticism of the president. Around 200 military officers, including all 93 who held political positions, were retired by Obasanjo in the first few months of his presidency reducing the likelihood of a military coup. In order to bring the defense ministry under more direct government supervision, he also relocated it from Lagos to Abuja. In a contentious 2003 election with violent ethnic and religious undertones, Obasanjo was re-elected. Muslim and primarily supported by the North, his main rival was General Muhammadu Buhari, a fellow former military leader. Obasanjo won the election with 61.8% of the vote, beating Buhari by more than 11 million votes. Obasanjo faced criticism in November 2003 for his choice to give Charles Taylor, the ousted leader of Liberia, shelter. He and President Paul Bia of Cameroon signed the Green Tree Agreement on June 12, 2006, officially resolving the border dispute on the Bekasi Peninsula. Obasanjo gave the order for the evacuation of Nigerian troops from the Bekasi Peninsula to proceed even though the Nigerian Senate issued a resolution stating that it was unlawful. Obasanjo continued to oversee the growth of the nation's police force during his second term. It reached 325,000 officers in 2007. Obasanjo proclaimed a state of emergency in Plateau State in May 2004 suspending the state administration and establishing a six-month military rule as a result of ongoing rural violence between Muslims and Christians in that region. Orji Uzor Kalu, the then governor of Arbia State, petitioned the EFCC on August 22, 2005, saying that Obasanjo had engaged in corrupt behavior. Obasanjo was the subject of debate over his third-term agenda, which called for changing the constitution to allow him to run for office a third time for a four-year term. The Nigerian political media erupted over this, and the National Assembly decided not to pass the law. As a result, Obasanjo resigned following the general election in April 2007. Obasanjo denied involvement in the so-called third-term agenda in an exclusive interview given to Channel's television. He claimed that among the other provisions of the Nigerian constitution that needed to be modified, tenure extension was one that the National Assembly, Nigeria, had included. Obasanjo claimed that he had never considered running for a third term, 
Major political figures criticized Obasanjo during the third term agenda controversy. Former Nigerian Senate President Senator Ken Namani alleged that shortly after taking office, President Obasanjo told him about the plan. As soon as I was elected Senate President, he informed me of his goals and explained how he planned to carry them out. I didn't originally take him seriously until things started to happen. Additionally, he implied that 8 billion naira had been used to bribe lawmakers in order to advance the agenda. He questioned how someone could claim to be unaware of something while at the same time exchanging money in both local and foreign currencies. Namani's account was confirmed by Femi Bajabiamila, who stated the amount differently. The money amounted over N10 billion. When you were the president in office and the initiative was not your idea, how could N10 billion be taken from the national treasury? Where did the funds originate? If you want to be convinced that the man is only telling a lie, pick up a copy of the book written by Condoleezza Rice, the former secretary to the government of the United States of America. Namani claimed that President George W. Bush warned Obasanjo to desist from his plan to run for president a third time. Actually, Rice's autobiography is what it is. She mentioned Obasanjo's conversation with Bush on pages 628 or 638, describing how he informed the former American president that he intended to investigate ways to modify the Constitution so that he could run for a third term. He was shocked when Bush advised against trying it. Bush advised him to depart by May 29, 2007, as a patriot. Obasanjo increased Nigerians' literacy levels by establishing the Universal Basic Education Program and the Niger Delta Development Commission with the money earned from oil. He also established the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission and the Independent Corrupt Practices Commission, revived the Kaduna and One Port Harcourt locations of the National Fertilizer Company. Obasanjo boosted the state of origin's percentage of oil royalties and rentals from 3 to 13 percent. Nigeria's GDP growth had been agonizingly sluggish since 1987 and had only reached 3 percent between 1999 and 2000 prior to Obasanjo's presidency. But under Obasanjo, the growth rate increased to 6 percent before he left office, in part due to higher oil prices. When he left government in 2007, Nigeria's foreign reserves had increased from $2 billion in 1999 to $43 billion. He was able to pay an additional $18 billion to be debt-free after receiving debt pardons from the Paris and London club totaling about $18 billion. The majority of these loans were accrued during the exchange control period from short-term trade arrears, point of correction. The majority of these debts were amassed between 1982 and 1985, when Nigeria functioned under an exchange control regime that ceded control of all foreign exchange operations to the country's central bank. Nigeria's economy was in a dire position when Obasanjo gained office. Inflation in the 1990s had been above 30% annually, and by 2001, about 20% of adults in Nigeria were unemployed. Widespread poverty was addressed by Obasanjo's administration by paying N3,500 per month to almost 200,000 individuals to perform ordinary jobs like sweeping and fixing roads. This program was later superseded by a national poverty eradication program that put an emphasis on creating rural infrastructure, jobs for young people, and conservation. The statutory minimum wage was quadrupled by Obasanjo's administration in 2000. The International Monetary Fund, IMF, which warned that the government was spending excessively, was requested to examine Nigeria's economy and provide recommendations for how to make it better. Obasanjo stated in 2001 that he was a believer in market efficiency and mentioned that he had first-hand experience with the harm brought on by public sector incompetence. Government spending as a share of GDP increased from 29% in 1997 to 50% in 2001, despite the president's adherence to the Washington consensus of free markets, 
privatization, and restrained government spending. Nigeria secured a US$1 billion United States dollars standby loan in January 2000, enabling the government to start discussions with its creditors on rescheduling its debt. During his first term as president, Obasanjo's administration benefited from rising oil prices around the world. It intended to boost both Nigeria's oil production and the nation's production of liquefied natural gas, which was initially exported in 1999. Obasanjo was committed to eliminating the gasoline subsidy and raising prices to market rates. In response, the Nigerian Labour Congress scheduled a nationwide strike for June 2000. Obasanjo ultimately made a concession and reduced the subsidy rather than outright eliminating it. Obasanjo was able to take on the persona as an enemy of the poor. As a result of this circumstance, Obasanjo went to privatization in order to further cut costs, establishing a national council on privatization in July 1999. Obasanjo anticipated that many of Nigeria's federal government's 588 public enterprises, but not those engaged in oil production, could be sold off because they accounted for more than 55% of the country's external debt when he assumed office. According to an opinion poll conducted in 2000, only 35% of Nigerians supported privatization. Obasanjo was eager to discuss debt relief. He maintained that Nigeria's debts jeopardized its economy and democracy and were so high as to be unpayable. Nigeria's debts were forgiven by Canada, Italy, and the US, but these were relatively minor loans, and the country's largest creditor, the UK, refused. Obasanjo attributed a large portion of Nigeria's economic woes to the nation's pervasive corruption. In 2000, Transparency International named Nigeria the most corrupt nation in the world. A few days after entering office, he presented the National Assembly with an anti-corruption bill, which was met with strong criticism from those who believed it gave the government excessive power. Obasanjo was able to approve the new law in June 2000 because to compromises that weakened his plans. There is no proof that corruption in Nigeria decreased under Obasanjo's first term, and his administration did nothing to stop the country's pervasive low-level corruption which was prevalent at the state and local government levels. In Nigeria, public health was a major concern. Nigeria spent the joint lowest percentage of GDP on public health services throughout the 1990s, about 0.2% of GDP. This was raised by the Obasanjo administration to more than 0.4%. The HIV-AIDS epidemic was Nigeria's most pressing health challenge, and soon after taking office, Obasanjo ordered a situation report on the issue. In order to organize a campaign for 2000 to 2003 that would concentrate on publicity, training, counseling, and testing to combat the virus, he then established a presidential committee on AIDS, which he served as chair of. He also established a National Action Plan Committee. He started a new primary care initiative to improve public health more broadly, using monies from the local government to attempt to establish a clinic in each of Nigeria's 774 local government districts. Obasanjo accomplished one of his main goals, which was to repair Abacha's damage to Nigeria's international standing. He traveled for more than a quarter of his first term, and by October 2002, he had been to 92 different nations. The major nations in sub-Saharan Africa, South Africa and Nigeria, established a Benational Commission in October 1999 to discuss collaboration between the two nations. Obasanjo maintained Nigeria's strong connections with the United States by sending American experts to assist with the military training in Nigeria. He was friendly with George W. Bush, who succeeded Bill Clinton as President of the United States. Bush visited Abuja in 2000, and Obasanjo went to Washington, D.C. In 2006, he attended his first Commonwealth Conference in November 1999 and hosted that event in December 2003, 
where he was awarded an honorary knighthood by British Queen Elizabeth II, in an effort to maintain better ties with the UK than he had in the 1970s. Obasanjo had promised to remove Nigerian troops from Sierra Leone upon becoming president. He set a timeline for their departure in August 1999, but it was put on hold while a UN peacekeeping force was put together, with Nigeria contributing 4,000 soldiers. In 2005, this force withdrew. In August 2003, Obasanjo sent Nigerian troops into Liberia in response to unrest there. Two months later, they were placed under UN direction. Charles Taylor, the expelled leader of Liberia, was given asylum in Nigeria by Obasanjo, who later returned him to Liberia at the request of the country's new president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, so that he might stand trial for war crimes. He declined demands for the Nigerian military to take part in an ECOMOG intervention in the Guinea-Bissau Civil War and the 2002 peacekeeping mission to the Côte d'Ivoire in order to keep Nigeria out of domestically unpopular conflicts. He helped mediate a dispute with Robert Mugabe's Zimbabwean government over the latter's facilitation of the violent takeover of white-owned farms at the UK's request. He was a member of a group that the Commonwealth assigned to deal with Zimbabwe, together with the presidents of South Africa and Australia. Thabo Mbeki and John Howard were also on the group. In an attempt to use quiet diplomacy, Obasanjo and Mbeki went to Zimbabwe three times. They unsuccessfully urged Mugabe to step down or establish a power-sharing government with the opposition movement for democratic change. The role of Islamic Sharia law in Nigerian politics quickly became a hot topic following Obasanjo's election. Since the nation's independence, Sharia law had been applied to civil disputes involving Muslims in the northern states, which outraged some Muslims. Criminal matters were not subject to Sharia law. Ahmed Sani, the governor of Zamfara state, declared the full adoption of Sharia as the foundation for its penal code in September 1999. He made it clear, however, that it would only apply to Muslim citizens and not the non-Islamic minorities. Christian minorities in northern Nigeria were alarmed by this, and protests and counter-protests led to bloodshed, particularly in Kaduna. Christian sentiment in Nigeria was overwhelmingly opposed to using Sharia as the foundation for state criminal justice systems. The National Assembly encouraged Obasanjo to appeal the case to the Supreme Court in both houses. He didn't want the application of Sharia to become a constitutional problem, thus he was eager to avoid it. He made an effort to publicly distinguish between real Sharia and political Sharia praising the former and maintaining that the latter was a passing trend that would fade away. Many people in the South criticized Obasanjo for his lack of bravery for not intervening, and conservative Muslims in the North made fun of him. Four more northern states implemented Sharia penal law in 2000, and seven more did so in 2001 in response to widespread demand from Muslim communities. The problem, according to Obasanjo, was the most difficult thing he had ever had to deal with as president. When Obasanjo assumed office, he was horrified by the tremendous turmoil and violence that had killed thousands of people in Nigeria. A rapidly expanding population that brought with it spiraling urbanization and struggle for scarce land in rural regions was exacerbating this violence. Obasanjo increased the nation's police force from 120,000 to 240,000 between 1999 and 2003 to combat this. Under Obasanjo's leadership, little was done to address police brutality, and suspect torture remained common. Ethnic tensions were another source of the violence, as various ethnic and regional groups demanded more autonomy prompting some observers to anticipate Nigeria's dissolution. Obasanjo made maintaining national unity a top priority. He would only occasionally use the military to put an end to disturbance. He preferred to avoid having to call out the army unless state governors specifically requested it. 
He stated that his own stance and philosophy is that military force should only be used after all other options have failed. In order to promote harmony, he valued forgiveness, amnesty, and reconciliation more than the criminal justice system's ability to exact retribution on offenders. The amount of violence and disorder in Nigeria decreased when Obasanjo was president. The Niger Delta was a significant center of separatist movement because indigenous tribes there desired to keep a larger share of the wealth generated by the region's abundant oil deposits. In an effort to stop the violence in the Niger Delta, Obasanjo proposed a bill to the National Assembly in July 1999 that would establish a commission to develop and carry out a strategy for the area. The commission was finally established in December 2000 after significant discussion. He also dispatched two army battalions into the Niger Delta in November 1999 in order to catch the Asawana Boys, an Ijo organization that had kidnapped and murdered police officers in Odi, by Elsa State. Most of the town was demolished by the military. Although the government stated that just 43 people perished, a local NGO estimated that 2,483 civilians perished. When visiting Odi in March 2001, Obasanjo called the destruction, avoidable, and regrettable, but he refused to hold the army accountable, apologize for the damage, pay reparations, or restore the town, the latter of which was done by the Niger Delta Development Commission. In 2000, Obasanjo ordered the leaders of the Udua People's Congress, OPC, a Yoruba nationalist organization that engaged in violence against other ethnicities, to be arrested. Around 500 people were killed in rioting in Plateau State in September 2001 between native Christians and northern Muslim traders before the army intervened and reclaimed control. Then, Obasanjo went and pushed for peace. In Kano in October 2001, Muslim protesters killed about 200 Igbo in retaliation for Nigeria's backing of American bombing of Afghanistan. When Obasanjo returned to promote peace, the locals booed him. A Tiv militia later captured and killed the troops at Zaki Bayam, where they had been sent to ease tensions between the Yukon and Tiv communities along the boundaries between the states of Banu and Taraba. Obasanjo sent the army in, and they apprehended and executed up to 250 to 300 local guys. In 2002, Obasanjo made a trip there and issued an apology for the disproportionate use of force. Obasanjo ordered the mobile police to disband the Bakasi boys in January 2002. This vigilante gang, active largely in the states of Arbia and Anambra, was thought to have killed 2,000 people. He had previously been hesitant to do so because of the public backing the group had gained by taking on criminal gangs but as their support began to dwindle, he felt free to act. In the same month, an explosion at an ordnance storage facility in Lagos, a Jekka barracks, may have killed up to 1,000 people. Obasanjo arrived right away. Obasanjo sent the army in, and they apprehended and executed up to 250 to 300 local guys. In 2002, Obasanjo made a trip there and issued an apology for the disproportionate use of force. Obasanjo ordered the mobile police to disband the Bakasi boys in January 2002. This vigilante gang, active largely in the states of Arbia and Anambra, was thought to have killed 2,000 people. He had previously been hesitant to do so because of the public backing the group had gained by taking on criminal gangs but as their support began to dwindle, he felt free to act. In the same month, an explosion at an ordnance storage facility in Lagos, a Jekka barracks, may have killed up to 1,000 people. Obasanjo arrived right away. Obasanjo sent the army in, and they apprehended and executed up to 250 to 300 local guys. In 2002, Obasanjo made a trip there and issued an apology for the disproportionate use of force. Obasanjo ordered the mobile police to disband the Bakasi boys in January 2002. This vigilante gang, 
active largely in the states of Arbia and Anambra, was thought to have killed 2,000 people. He had previously been hesitant to do so because of the public backing the group had gained by taking on criminal gangs, but as their support began to dwindle, he felt free to act. In the same month, an explosion at an ordnance storage facility in Lagos, a Jeka barracks, may have killed up to 1,000 people. Oba Sanjo arrived right away. He intends to sit in the passenger seat giving guidance and ready to grab the wheel if Nigeria goes off course, as one Western diplomat put it. In April 2012, he voluntarily left his position as head of the PDP Board of Trustees. After that, he stopped participating in PDP politics. Oba Sanjo was, allegedly, indicted in March 2008 by a committee of the Nigerian parliament for awarding energy contracts worth $2.2 billion during his eight-year administration without following the proper procedures. Due to the leadership of the Power Probe Committee's manipulation of the entire process, the report of this investigation was never recognized by the full Nigerian parliament. No public record exists that Chief Obasanjo was charged. In a letter to President Goodluck Jonathan in May 2014, Obasanjo asked him to act as a mediator on behalf of the Nigerian government to secure the release of the Chibok girls being detained by Boko Haram insurgents. He left the opposition party on February 16, 2015 and during a news conference told a PDP ward chairman to rip out his membership card. Later, he became regarded as the APC's navigator, the newly created opposition party. He emailed serving President Muhammadu Buhari on January 24, 2018, outlining his weaknesses and urging him not to seek for office in 2019. All of his letters to presidents who were in office at the time of their demise so far. His political organization, the Coalition for Nigeria Movement, CNM, was introduced in Abuja on January 31, 2018. To realize its vision of a better Nigeria, the movement adopted the political party African Democratic Congress, ADC, on May 10, 2018. On November 20, 2018, he made an official announcement about rejoining the People's Democratic Party the largest opposition group, during the presentation of former President Goodluck Jonathan's book, My Transition Hours. He announced his retirement from partisan politics on January 22, 2022, following a meeting with national delegates of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, at his home in Ota, Ogun State, Nigeria. Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, named Oba Sanjo as a special envoy to the war-torn Democratic Republic of the Congo. President Joseph Kabila of the DRC and rebel commander Laurent Nkunda were the subjects of separate meetings. A mission of African Union election monitors was led by Oba Sanjo during the Zimbabwean elections in July 2013. Oba Sanjo's doctoral thesis was successfully defended at the National Open University of Nigeria in December 2017. Noun. He currently has a doctorate in theology. About two years earlier, he had successfully completed the identical course for his master's degree. Oba Sanjo was a Nigerian nationalist in terms of ideology. He firmly believed that Nigeria should remain a United Nation state rather than being divided along ethnic lines. He was dedicated to a particular brand of Nigerian patriotism. His long-term objective, according to a statement he made in 2001, was the nullification of all kinds of identification other than Nigerian citizenship. He argued that dividing Nigeria along ethnic lines will lead to the same level of ethnic cleansing and carnage as the Yugoslav wars of the 1990s. Ilife contended that Obasanjo's Nigerian nationalism was influenced by both his separation from the Yoruba elite and by his time serving in the army, where he was stationed with soldiers of many different ethnicities. Democracy is the best type of government now in existence that guarantees a reasonable level of participation by the majority of the population in the means and topics that concern their governance, 
even if it does not necessarily guarantee rapid economic development or prosperity. The choice that the governed favor is democracy. According to Obasanjo, democracy is the only integrative glue that can permanently unite various sub-national groups into a nation with common destinies, equal status, and a common identity. Eilif remarked that through instead, he claimed that there should be no restriction on the number of political parties that may be established, however he also recommended that Nigeria should become a one-party state if this could not happen. Obasanjo once more supported multi-party systems as a result of the early 1990s Soviet Union collapse and the ensuing shift toward multi-party politics across Africa. Eilif observed that Obasanjo shown open-minded pragmatism in his role as a politician. Obasanjo occasionally used the deliberate polarization of a topic as a strategy to gain support for his viewpoint. Gout Obasanjo's tenure, a focus on consensus politics served as a guiding principle. Obasanjo criticized institutionalized opposition to the government while in power in the 1970s. This was, in his opinion, profoundly at odds with the majority of African political culture and practice. He felt that opposition parties should offer constructive criticism rather than perpetual resistance to the administration, and that politicians should seek consensus rather than engage in constant rivalry. He believed that political rivalry had a destabilizing effect that was especially risky for a developing nation like Nigeria and that stability should be protected. In the early 1980s, Obasanjo started advocating for a one-party state in Nigeria after growing frustrated with what he saw as the shortcomings of representative democracy. Nevertheless, he argued that this one-party state had to encourage citizen engagement in governance uphold human rights, and defend the right to free speech. Later in the 1980s, he issued a warning against Babangida's proposed two-party system because he thought that, despite Babangida's vision of a centre-left and centre-right party competing against one another, the system would inevitably result in one party representing the Christian South and the other the Muslim North. Instead, he claimed that there should be no restriction on the number of political parties that may be established, however he also recommended that Nigeria should become a one-party state if this could not happen. Obasanjo once more supported multi-party systems as a result of the early 1990s Soviet Union collapse and the ensuing shift toward multi-party politics across Africa. Eilif observed that Obasanjo shown open-minded pragmatism in his role as a politician. Obasanjo occasionally used the deliberate polarization of a topic as a strategy to gain support for his viewpoint. Eilif believed that despite Obasanjo's inexperience in the anti-colonialist campaign for Nigerian independence from British control, the optimism and dedication of the movement had marked forever his life. Obasanjo's job as president was to make sure Nigeria ran smoothly on both a political and economic level. Over the course of his political career, Obasanjo transitioned from a commitment to market liberalism that was prevalent in the 1990s to a conviction in the benefits of state engagement in heavy industry, which was widespread in the 1970s. Eilif believed that during his professional life, Obasanjo has consistently shown ambivalence on the extent of government involvement in the economy. He generally believed that laziness was the root of poverty. Obasanjo described himself as a market-oriented social democrat while running for president in 1999, however he was evasive about his suggested economic plan. His administration brought together individuals who believed in free markets, supported more protectionist economic policies, and supported socialism. Obasanjo held ideological debates on capitalism and socialism in low regard. He frequently made choices based on political factors rather than on legal or constitutional standards, which worried some of his detractors. Erfler believed that Obasanjo was a cautious reformer during his first term in government. Books by Alusagun Obasanjo, My Watch Volume 1, 
Early Life and Military. My Watch Volume 2, Political and Public Affairs. My Watch Volume 3, Now and Then. My Command. In Ziogwu. The Animal Called Man. A New Dawn. The Thabo Mbeki I Know. Africa Through the Eyes of a Patriot. Making Africa Work. A Handbook. Forging a Compact in U.S.-African Relations. The 5th David M. Absha Endowed Lecture. The 15th of December 1987. Africa in Perspective. Letters to Change the World. From Pankhurst to Orwell. Not My Will. Democracy Works. Rewiring Politics to Africa's Advantage. My Watch. Challenges of Leadership in Africa. War Wounds. Development Costs of Conflict in Southern Sudan. Guides to Effective Prayer. The Challenges of Agricultural Production and Food Security in Africa. Addressing Africa's Youth Employment and Food Security Crisis. The Role of African Agriculture in Job Creation. Dust Suspended. A Memoir of Colonial, Overseas and Diplomatic Service Life 1953-1986. L'Afrique en Marche. Un Manuel pour la Roycite Economique. Africa's Critical Choices. A Call for a Pan-African Roadmap.